Town of Great Barrington. You have your hand up. Oh God, Steve, you know what? Let me, um, that I, I'm still Town of Great Barrington because I'm logged on um, from the Finance Committee. So let me get out of there. I'll come back in. But are you gonna promote the Finance Committee up to panelists as well? Yes. Okay, all right, I'm gonna come back in and it's me. Okay, bye. Okay. How are we doing, Steve? Good, Eric, how are you? Good, good, you hear me okay? Perfect. All right. Uh, a meeting such as this, is there gonna be an intermission for more popcorn and drinks or how's this I work? I'm gonna serve pizza, but I couldn't figure out how to do it during a Zoom meeting. So. All right, just check. <laughs> Anna Dwyer, you, you should be promoted there. There you are. I am promoted. Perfect. Steve, if I can help with any um, of the, again, of the Zoom presenting stuff, just let me know. Okay, that'd be great. If I need you, I definitely will ask. Yeah, you'll need, but just a heads up, you need to make me a co-host for me to do anything. Okay. All right, but I do have all of Scanlon's reports downloaded and scanned and prepared to share if anybody has any questions. Okay, perfect.
So it is six o'clock. I believe we have both the entire select board and finance committee here, and I will get started. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, JL chapter 30A, section 18, and the governor's June 16, 2021 revised order extending remote participation by all members in any meeting of a public body. This meeting, the Great Barrington Select Board and joint meeting of the Select Board and Finance Committee will be conduct conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and our parties with a right and a requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town's website. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Pursuant to Mass General Law 7C 30A Section 20F, after notifying the chair of the public body, any person may make a video or audio recording of an open session of a meeting of a public body or may transmit the meeting through any medium. At the beginning of the meeting, the chair shall inform other attendees of any such recordings. So this meeting is being recorded by CTSB. It is being recorded by the town. It is recording being recorded by the Berkshire Edge and the Berkshire Eagle, as well as other members of the public. Any members of the public wishing to speak at the meeting must receive permission of the chair. The listing of agenda items are those reasonably anticipated by the chair, which may be discussed at the meeting. Not all items listed may in fact be discussed and other items not listed may be brought up for discussion to the extent permitted by law. So we'll start with a roll call of each board. Phil, do you wanna start with the finance committee? Phil, you're muted. How about a roll call of the finance committee? This is Ann O'Dwyer, I'm here. Meredith O'Connor here. Tom Lava present. Um, I think. Uh, um, I think Michelle is going to be joining us. A little Michelle later. is in transit, and uh, Philip, yeah. Yeah, Michelle will join us shortly, hopefully. And uh, I am here as well. And for the select board, Garfield here. Eric here. Ed here. Lee here. And I am present. The entire select board is here. Um, I will turn it over to Mark and Sue. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I'd like to just introduce Tom Scanlon from Scanlon and Associates. He's here tonight to present the fiscal 19 and fiscal 20 uh, audits. So Tom, turn it over to you. Oh, sounds good. Uh, good to see everyone, at least on screen anyways. Uh, it's been, uh, I guess it's been a long 18 months for uh, everyone. Um, so you do, you do, uh, have the two audits, uh, in front of you. Um, just wanted to go over just like what an audit is, what's our main objective. Uh, our main objective is to opine on the financial statements. Uh, the town did receive two clean opinions for both 19 and 20, uh, which is always good. Uh, always good to see. Um, so if you go into the bond market, if you're applying for any grants, um, and that sort of stuff. Just want to walk through. We could probably just walk through 20 financials. Uh, one of going back through 19. Um, so um, the 20 financials on page three and four. That's the audit opinion. Um, like I said, it's a clean opinion as far as the town's financial uh, accounting ledgers, the upkeep. Uh, you know, very sound um, audit practices. And then as I kind of just want to walk you through the financials is on page 15 and 16. Um, I think with uh, governmental financial statements, they're very unique. Uh, you actually have two balance sheets um, in a government's financial statements as compared to like in the private sector to companies, you have one balance sheet. Uh, so you have like just, you have two uh, measurement focuses um, so on page 15, 16, that's your entity wide financial statements. Um, I think probably the only ones that really get use out of these are uh, accountants. Uh, um, they are on the full cruel method of accounting. Uh, as you look on the balance sheet on page 15, you'll see capital assets uh, recorded as an asset there. Um, 
and they're being depreciated. Again, you don't have depreciation in your budget. Um, so this, this presentation is more on the long-term focus. Um, and I just like something that would jump out at you is if you go under unrestricted net position, you'll see a negative 5.3 million. Um, it's always not good to see your unrestricted net position in, in a negative. Uh, the two drivers of that are OPEB. Um, mm. You can see under non-current liabilities, your OPEB is 18.4 million. Um, again, OPEB, it's just the acronym is other post-employment benefits, which is the promises you made to your retirees to pay a portion of their health insurance um, when they retire. And that is one of the drivers of the uh, 5.3 million negative. Um, and also the net pension liability, which is right below it, but you are on a funding schedule or you pay an annual assessment to uh, the county retirement system. I believe that's gonna be fully funded 2022. Um, unlike uh, OPEB, which you don't have a funding schedule. Um, so these are the primary focuses on these. I don't think questions that people have on the ND wide statements. Yeah. Yeah. That's always good. <laughs> um, and then on pages 17, 18, is it? Yep. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I do say a hand. Uh, yeah, I did, I did. Um, I guess I did have a question. I yeah. was noticing that the unrestricted, so if this is OPEP, the unrestricted in 2019 was, was about seven and a half million and it's gone yep. down to about five and a third. Is that just fluctuations or is there something we've been doing? Should we be pleased with ourselves or, you know, it could, it could look different next year? You should be pleased with yourself because I was just going to oh. go over that on next thing. So you oh. could segue. Okay. <laughs> Happy to help uh, out. <laughs> okay. So on pages 17 and 18, these are more your traditional financial statements, which is the finance committee and board selecting they can relate to. Um, again, they're on the modified accrual. So you don't see depreciation on here. You don't see full accrual where what your bill you're putting in. Um, and as you look down under the general fund uh, balance sheet on page 17, unassigned, you'll see your unassigned fund balance is 7.3 million. Um, and the, basically what unassigned really represents to you is your free cash and your stabilization fund balances. So if you take the two together, um, plus some gap accruals for six day receipts, that will, will come to uh, the 7.3 million. For a town your size, that is very healthy. Um, and I think your, your financial practices uh, and your um, beliefs and your policies, uh, I, I think they're very sound. Um, so, and then as a benchmark way, um, bond rating agencies look at you, they are really looking at unassigned fund balance and how it compares to your total expenditures um, slash budget, but your budget's around the 28.5 million. So that number is roughly about 25%, which is an outstanding benchmark. Uh, generally, they like to see bond rate between 10 and 15% is, is very good. Anything above 15 um, is excellent. So when you're in that range, um, it's good. Uh, one of the drivers of that in, in 2020, um, hence you can see the leap is on page 18. That's your, basically your change in fund balance. And if we focus on the general fund, um, you'll see your general fund increased $2.9 million, um, which is very good. Uh, bond rate ACs will look at that and say, geez, you're, you're, you're increasing uh, your general fund. Um, and the two big drivers of that is if you go over to page 21, <clears throat> this is your budget versus actual just for the general fund. And you can see as we lay it out, um, you see the original budget and final budget and then the actual. And as we look at, compared to what you budgeted to what you took in for your revenues, you exceeded your budgetary uh, revenues of 4.1 million. Um, and you'll see it in the hotel room and cannabis taxes along with license permits and fees. 1.8 million, 1.7. The drivers of that is the host agreement for um, 
the marijuana facilities of 1.5 and also the excise tax of 1.4. So it's marijuana that helped you get to uh, the 2020 increase. Um, I'm sorry, this is Anne again, and I'm, I'm so yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to find where you are. And I just, um, I just got a message from Michelle. She wanted us for the record that she's been on the call. She just is listening, so isn't speaking, but she isn't. So the finance committee is all here. But um, Tom, you mentioned, I see the 4.1. Where are you getting the 1.5? Uh, it, 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 so in uh, the license permits and fees, if you go over see the uh, variance compared to the budgets, 1.773 million. Yep. Mm -hmm. Of that, the primary driver and there's 1.5 uh, uh, community host fee for marijuana. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So you didn't budget for it. It came in as revenue. Um, that's a big yeah. component of the variance. And then if you go up to the 1.8 million, just above uh -huh. between the hotel room meals and cannabis uh -huh. excise taxes. Okay. The 1.8, 1.4 has to do with uh, marijuana excise. Wow. All right. Thank you. So those two swings and as we look then this is the column all the way out is how you're um how you're generating free cash and how in essence your fund balance should uh grow um so when you look at um between your final budget how you funded it you use basically three million in free cash to fund uh your budget but then you turn around and you generated 5.3 um so hence when you go over to page 18 and see that large increase these are the drivers of it. Um, I, I did notice, and I know I've talked to Sue about it in the past, and just, is you use free cash to reduce your tax rate. I'm not a big proponent of that, um, but I feel like you guys have a handle on your financial policies and how you're using it um, and going forward and reducing the tax rate with it. So uh, where other communities can get themselves in trouble, I feel like uh, you have a handle on that. Um, because usually when you do, when you take your free cash and reduce your tax rate, it's usually a one-time revenues, unless you have something dropping off in your budget, um, you can get yourself in a hole pretty quick. Um, but that's the only thing I'd kind of caution you on as far as your, your financial policies. But I do feel like you have enough expertise in your monitoring and you, you understand the reasons why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, so that's kind of that's all I really have to say about the financial statements that you know that, that jumps out you yeah, that two point three million. Usually, when you look at um, cities and towns, you don't have a big increase um, like that in the general fund. Usually, bond rating sees will look at a three year period on you, um, and I don't think you budgeted any revenues for twenty twenty two either to do or twenty in twenty twenty one. So you're not budgeting. The marijuana, which is good, um, in my opinion, you know, you're increasing your reserves um, going for. I, I, I do think, I don't know if that host fee will, will stay around forever. Um, so that's kind of, I don't know if you have any, anyone has any questions on any of that. Um, questions? Phil, go ahead. Yes, I have a question back to the, uh, the OPEB or the other post-employment uh, benefits. Yep, yep. Um, it just, you know, just the, obviously, I mean, I think we all shouldn't be too surprised by this, but if I have this correctly, it's gone from at the end of 2018, which we don't have in front of us right now, that was 15, roughly 15.7 million. Um, and just in, 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 at the end of 2000, as of June 30th, 2020, it's gone to 20.5 million. So it's basically gone up. Five million, roughly, roughly twenty-five percent in two years. So, we all we all intuitively understand that medical expenses are going up. But I'm just wondering if there's anything else going on in that calculation which triggered such a fast uh, um, and steep increase in that number. Well, I, I think are you looking just at the uh, liability piece. Correct. Yeah, yeah. You also have to factor in the deferred inflows and outflows. Um, if you look up, but then you know, GASB has defined certain things that aren't liabilities, and they classify them as deferred inflow and a deferred outflow. Um, so when you look at um, 
the liability, you have to factor in the outflows and the inflow. So on June 30th, 2020, on page 15, if you look for the deferred outflows of OPEB 4.1, that is actually being amortized over a period of, I think it might be 5.5 years you have there. Um, and what, what those sort of things is change in assumptions. Um, maybe the medical trend went from an assumption of increasing 4% a year. And in May, the actual experience was 1%. So that 3% has to be amortized. So therefore, your liability could grow, but it's being offset by a deferred uh, outflow. So you have to really take the net of those through the years. Well, isn't, um, isn't the, the net OPEB liability the net the net of all those factors? Or, or no, the net OPEB liability is your uh, unfunded accrued liability, actuarial base, less if you had a trust fund. That's why they call it the net pension. Right, liability. right. But, but the deferred outflow is going to be a change in assumptions. Um, I don't have your actuary report in front of me. I can give you a breakdown. So the liability, the liability will grow. And then plus discount rate, discount rates have been jumping all over the place um, the past couple of years. Well, obviously this is, this is a fairly, uh, you know, elaborate calculation, but yeah, um, right. so I'm not asking you to go too deep into the, the details here, but it, again, just for the, you know, it's gone from in a two year period, it went from 15.7 million. To, you know, 20.7 million, if I have that right. 20.6 million. Okay. Depending on how you calculate it, either, you know, 25 or 35% increase. Um, well. and, if you, and if you look at the deferred uh, outflows, which is really an asset that went from 876,000 to a million to 4.6. So that will, should reduce your liability because it's being amortized over a period of time. I believe that was a change in assumptions that was the driver of that one. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I'd certainly be happy to sort of have a, if it's appropriate, I'd be happy to have a follow-on conversation with you about this calculation. It's pretty arcane, yeah. so I don't want to bog everyone down in this in this topic. But um, I would like to have a, a separate conversation with you about this. Just to understand. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. You definitely, you know, I can. I'll follow or mark my contact information. Give me a call, email. Absolutely, okay. discussion. That's. I know right. have the calculations. Uh, I don't want to. I don't yeah. want to inflict this on everyone else, but uh, yeah. I would like to understand it better. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you, when you look at your liability, it's a huge number. Do I believe it's 18.4? Probably not. Do I believe it's zero? No, but it's all the conversations of, of being taken place that's going to hold it. Is, it is a liability of your town. Um, there's a lot of drivers yeah. up there, you know. Yeah, again, we all understand it. It's a liability of town. It's a commitment that's been made. And we all understand the medical costs are going up. I understand that. I just, the, the rate of that increase to me is is more than I would have expected. But we could discuss that in a separate. Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, one thing you could, you know, encourage is OPEB trust. Uh, you don't, I don't believe you have an OPEB trust. Uh, you can. Okay. No, we can, we can do that. I mean, that's something you could say. I mean, I wouldn't, if you do do an OPEB trust, I wouldn't put free cash into it, I'd have something that would go into your tax rate um, more than free cash because I, I don't recommend taking a, a, a easily accessible reserve and putting it into something restrictive reserve. That you're no, I, I agree. And we're not. Yeah. So, no. can, so I'm not advocating that, but I appreciate you bringing it up. But we could, again, we could discuss it separately. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know any other questions. Tom? No. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Tom, I had a, uh, just a question. I see that the tax liens uh, up quite a bit over the last year. And I don't know if you can speak to what's driving that or if Sue could. I mean, it went from 470000 to 1059000 Yeah, and, that, and that's just principal base. That's just the real estate. That doesn't include uh, accrued interest or anything either. So it's going to be a little bit higher with accrued interest. Does that mean that delinquencies are going up or? Yes, yeah. it, 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 it's, a, it's a driver of, 
the issues that were in your tax collector's office. Um, so that, that doesn't surprise me as well as the experience I have with, with it. Um, I think there's a lot of back taxes that wasn't taken and we took them. Um, and I believe it, did, did you get some large payoffs in 21, Sue? I think when we talked. So you're muted. No. Sorry about that. There you go. I'm not used to using the iPad. Um, I believe you're correct, Tom. I do think we had some large payoffs in FY21. Okay. I don't have the numbers handy though. Yeah. So there was a, so and you know what created the, the situation. It, it, we got behind not we but town got behind a tax title. Um. So okay. and. Fiscal year 20, we took the tax takings for 18, 19, and 20, which is the result of the 659,000. Um, so it's kind of an, an unraveling of getting the, like the accounts where they were all rolled up into one. Now they're kind of like put back to the fiscal years and now the takings took place um, in fiscal year 20. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sue. Bill, go ahead. Yeah, one other question. Uh, uh, again, a little bit into the weeds a bit. Yep. Uh, on page 46 of both years, uh, it appears that you added an additional just sort of schedule, which uh, uh, basically sums up the existing, uh, what you're describing as loan authorizations that have not been issued as of that date. So these are, this is authorized borrowing that has not yet been actually funded or incurred by the town. So I, I, it appears you added that for these years. It wasn't previously included. So I wonder if you could, if you were able to uh, indicate why you did that. Oh. Um, share probably oversight uh, to check that out because um, they should be in there. Um, so you're saying they weren't in an 18? Uh, I checked that and they weren't there. So I, I didn't go back to seven. Uh, yeah, because I've, I've 18 was our first year. Um, oversight. Okay. They, they, they well, I, I feel like really should be in there or something else. Yeah. I've seen myself. It's, it's just, sometimes our links, when we link Excel into the Word, um, sometimes when you make the final PDF, there's some things that get hidden. That's the only thing I could think of, but that, that's just sheer oversight. And would you, would you, is it, is it fair to say that this is a, having it included is a, is a more standard approach as opposed to not yes. including it? Yes. My, I'm looking at 18s now. My guess is if you look at 18 in page 45, um, is blank at the bottom, like it's cut halfway. All right. I would say that link didn't come over when the meeting. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. It happened. Yep. Yeah, I would say. Any That's other, okay. any questions? No other questions. Not seeing any, Tom? I don't see any, I don't. Yeah, so I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. No problem. And then, you know, if anyone has any questions about anything, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to me anytime. I, I don't. I enjoy talking about OPEB, even in the week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, have a thank good one. You. Okay, there's two more things on our joint meeting. So it's the budget policy for fiscal two, 2023. Um, Finance committee approved that tonight with the few changes that are in it. Uh, do I have a motion from the select board to approve? Then we'll discuss. Um, I make a motion to approve the uh, budget policy for fiscal 2023. Second. I have a motion by Lee, second by Ed. Any discussion? Uh, it's very... yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if go. I may briefly, just, just, just to, uh, for those that were not on the finance committee call, we, for expediency, uh, the finance committee is approving this uh, budget policy, which as you see is very similar to what was used last year, but but I think there we have a view that a more comprehensive review of this policy would make sense, um, and we need to budget we need to budget the time for that so we have a 
uh, an understanding at, at, at the Finance Committee that we'll do a more uh, comprehensive review of this document in sort of next September, October-ish timeframe. And then hopefully we'll have time to then come to the select board and, and go through our thinking on that without being too, uh, too rushed. Any other comments or questions? Okay, roll call vote. Uh, Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. And aye, so it's unanimous. And last we have on here, the budget meeting schedule. So on the last page of the budget policy, there's a, cal a calendar. Um, the budget meetings are highlighted as February, Tuesday, February 1st, Wednesday, February 2nd, Tuesday, February 8th, Wednesday, February 9th, and then not highlighted, but Tuesday, March 1st would be the public hearing. All of these at six o'clock. I just want to make sure that that's all set with the select board. Everyone had a chance to look at the calendars and make sure that's okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, so I'm seeing, Ed, you're okay with it? So I'm seeing nods to the head. We don't have to vote on it. The Finance Committee already voted on it and we're, we're, we're good, we'll be there. Any other comments from either the Finance Committee or Select Board before I open it up to citizens speak for this part of the meeting? No. Seeing none, uh, any citizens speak for this part of the meeting? Uh, Vivian Orlowski? Okay, I'm unmuted, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, just a quick comment, um, since I don't see um, any other opportunity to, to say this, um, I just wanted to thank uh, Chair Steve Bannon for forwarding a um, letter that I was able to put together over the weekend. I apologize for the late notice. Um, as, as you do, I have many other obligations, um, but I thought that this information that I conveyed uh, was either new research or something more important, which was the recommendation from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund uh, Board uh, concerning the, their recommendations that um, while they were made at a December 1st meeting, uh, the chair uh, was unable to, uh, due to computer problems, was unable to get them out until yesterday. So the uh, Finance Committee did not have this information either the research that I provided in the letter or the uh, Affordable Housing Trust Fund board recommendation when they made their recommendation to the select board. And I would just like to point that out and thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Vivian. Anyone else? Seeing no one else, if we, uh, the Finance Committee wants to adjourn we will go into the select board meeting. Uh, actually, I do have media time. Excuse me, I did not. I should take any media questions. Seeing none, Phil, do you want to just adjourn your board? I motion to adjourn uh, on the finance committee side. Okay. okay. I vote we adjourn. <laughs> uh, Tom? Aye. Aye. Meredith? Aye. Aye. I agree. We're adjourned. Okay. So, Steve, do you want to just send us back to being attendees or whoever we're we, doing? We will. Yes. Okay. I think we've got that down pretty well. We have uh, 34 attendees right now and six panelists. So my count is right. I didn't throw anyone out I wasn't supposed to. So that's a good sign. Okay, uh, this is now the select board regular meeting. First item is approval of minutes of November 8th, 2021 and November 22nd, 2021. 
Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve the minutes of November 8th and November 22nd, 2021. Second. I have a motion by Lee, second by Ed. Any discussion? Well, just one, <clears throat> one quick, minor, very minor. Um, November 8th, there's a vote about the liquor license for the farmer's market, the Hoosie Dome. It just says all in favor, and then it says 4-1. So it got the number right, but the all in favor could be confusing. Right, so it wasn't all in favor. Right. So can we pass. So it's it's the minutes of November eighth. It should just say motion passed or something like that. Well, it needs to say how every all four. It, all it does list. It lists the vote as a roll call vote. Okay, so and, we just yeah. need to remove that. Right. And does it say how each select board member voted? I have a problem. Yes. Okay, that's the important part. Okay. With that change, any other discussion? A roll call vote, Garfield. Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. And I, it's unanimous. And thank you for tape for getting us caught up. Um, the minutes are very well done. They have been very well done, but we've been very far behind. And it's nice to see the select board caught up. We should uh, set an example for everyone not lag behind. And we, we finally have done that. We, you know, we had reasons, but it's nice to be to be caught up. So select board's announcement statements. Garfield? Um, nothing at the moment. Okay, Eric? Uh, yeah, just, just a couple of small things. Uh, one, I just wanted to remind everybody that Berkshire Grown's doing their holiday market uh, this Saturday at the Barrington Community Center, also known as the Hoosie Dome from 10 to two this Saturday. And also another fun event in Housatonic is going to be uh, open studios at Muse, which is at uh, 430 Park Street. And it's just going to be a bunch of artists showing them, showing off the space and, um, and all their work. So a couple of fun things to do if you're in Housatonic this weekend. Thanks, Thank sir. you. Ed? Okay. Lee? Yeah, ju just to mention that the uh, CPA uh, um, step two or CPC step two applications will be due on December 17th. Thank you. I have nothing. We'll go into the. Yeah, may I just may I back yeah, up from sure. It's actually something just in general, other than the fact that this is the time of year when we should all be thinking of each other, being kind to each other. I think as a select board, we should also set an example, uh, but please be kind to your fellow citizens. Um, when you're in the store shopping, also please be safe, uh, wear your mask uh, when needed, but this is also the time of year to, to take care of yourself and take care of others. And uh, I just wanted to get that out there that uh, we need to treat each other well. Thank you, Garfield. Mark, Tom Andrews report. Thanks, Steve. I just have a few quick updates for you this evening. Uh, first on my list is Housatonic Waterworks and uh, Code Red messaging. I just wanted to mention that uh, we received complaints related to water quality, um, you know, from, from time to time. And uh, we do pass those messages on uh, anytime there's work being uh, done to the system and uh, anytime we're aware of, of pending work. So, uh, what I wanted to say tonight, though, is that that uh, we also receive complaints from time to time about our messaging and, and the use of our code red system. And I just wanted to clarify that we are uh, sharing these messages uh, as a as a um, as a way to communicate with Housatonic residents on behalf of Housatonic Water Works. So our role is limited, and we share the messages we receive when we receive them, or as soon as possible after receiving them. So uh, that's the reason why we include Housatonic Waterworks contact information at the very tail end of those messages. And we encourage people to reach out to Housatonic Waterworks if they have concerns or questions directly. Um, so again, you know, we're, we're happy to pass that, those messages along uh, and we do them as quickly as possible. But I just wanted to remind everyone that, that we are uh, sharing that information uh, to, to assist with our um, uh, to assist our customers in Housatonic. And then my next update here is uh, related to the American Rescue Plan Act or, or ARPA. So included in your packet for this evening was a copy of the ARPA survey. 
uh, and a summary of the results of that survey. And Tate Coleman's here tonight to walk you through our findings and then uh, we'll continue to meet as a staff committee uh, to work on a recommendation and an executive summary present at a later date to the board. But this is just to keep the uh, information flowing and the conversation moving along. So that said, I'll uh, let, let Tate take it from here. Hello. Um, here, I should be sharing my screen. Can you see? We, we can. Okay, great. Okay, so this is a, so the survey that we, that the town did on funds use for ARPA is what I'm going to be talking about today. And just a review of the results from that survey. Um, so it was distributed online and in print, it was available in Spanish. Uh, there was a 21 day or so input period and it was promoted by the town like it was on the town website for citizens and then it was in print at the people's pantry um berkshire south regional community center sent it out chp off made it available uh, the senior center distributed the survey as well and in addition to the berkshire food co-op oh. So the categories that we have for possible funds use. Uh, so public health programs, including vaccination, testing, contract, contact tracing, um, medical expenses, and then also reducing negative economic impacts of COVID-19. So we can provide money to households for food, rent, and housing. Also money to small businesses. Uh, additionally, the other Two categories are extra pay for essential workers and funding for capital projects, for example, water, sewer, and high-speed internet projects. So the first, so I'm just gonna run through some of the questions. It's included in the packet as well, but just to give some highlights. Um, so in terms of who took our survey, 82% um, were residents of Great Barrington out of the respondents. Uh, but so that means 18% weren't Great Barrington residents, but out of those who uh, did not reside in Great Barrington, a one fifth, so about 20% were business owners or ran non for profits in Great Barrington. Um, and 72% worked in Great Barrington. And those who weren't residents uh, we're in nearby municipalities. I think we had a couple from Pittsfield and Monterey, possibly. Um, so we also asked what the name of the street was that people, the respondents lived on. So 216 out of our, so our um, overall sample size was 274. So out of those 216 Great Barrington residents, gave their um, the name of their street. So 12 and a half percent were Alford Road. Then other co common streets were Main Street around 6%, North Plain Road, 4%, East Street also around 4% and Castle Hill Avenue, 3%. I think Barrington Place was also another one <laughs> that we had about 3%. Uh, in terms of zip codes, Great Barrington, Monterey, uh, 01230, 68%, 18% uh, from Housatonic, and then, yeah, Pittsfield, and then 01245, which is just Monterey, uh, got a few responses. Do you, so when we're asking if people work in Great Barrington, 56% worked in Great Barrington. Um, of course, a few people later on in the comments noted that they were retired. Um, so, you know, other people went to school in Great Barrington. So that, you know, this is useful information, but uh, you can only draw so much from this particular metric. So also, we also asked uh, participants if they owned or operated a business or nonprofit. Uh, so 52 responses, we had 52 responses 
about 19, about a fifth, 19% owned or operated a business or nonprofit in Great Barrington. So out of those 43 or, you know, about 80% were residents of Great Barrington. Um, how has COVID affected their business? So if they owned a business, we asked this question. So just to give a general overview of how this worked. So we assigned, so I assigned numerical values to um, the answer. So very negative was one, very positive was five. And you can see the breakdown, like 17%, very negative, um, somewhat negative, 27%, not affected, 39%, somewhat positive, 6%, very positive, 11 to 12%. So then on average, so if we take the average of all of these, uh, based weighted average based on the percentages of who responded, um, businesses who responded to this survey, um, they were affected slightly negatively, generally. So 2.67 out of five. So somewhere between somewhat negative and not affected. Uh, we also asked where the businesses were located. So 22% were in Housatonic. Um, downtown Great Barrington, 18%. Stockbridge Road, 18%. Uh, and then some on South Main Street, 24% were home office. Then there were some other write-ins, home painter within the boundaries or a couple. Also, we asked for all respondents now, um, how has COVID affected your household? So we again used the same scale, um, very negative being one, very positive being five. As you can see, generally respondent uh, household who's responded, they were generally affected slightly negatively. So like 49% said slightly negative. And so it averaged out to about slightly negative. Also, we asked um, what would be most helpful to offset COVID-19 impacts. So they were asked to choose up to three responses or, or three options, sorry. Um, so 213 out of our 274 responded. And then here's a graph which depicts, so money for rent, utility, or mortgage was the top uh, at 51%, then healthcare, um, 39%, food assistance, 38. So the top three were money for, you know, the rent, utility, mortgage, healthcare, like mental health, and then food assistance. And then we also asked, um, we asked respondents to rank the, how the town, or like their top priorities for how the town can use the COVID relief funding. So you can see this distribution. So under fund public health programs, reduce negative economic impacts, extra pay for essential workers, fund, and then water sewer, high speed internet projects. So as you can see, negative economic impacts, reducing those, that was the hot top uh, response category where respondents indicated that as their highest priority. So I just went through, um, uh, so 46% selected this, of respondents selected this as their highest priority, 25% uh, as their second priority. So a combined 71% indicated this, so reducing negative economic impacts as either their first or second priority. So there's widespread support for this um, is what we can probably conclude uh, based on our sample response size. And then extra pay for essential workers, 14% selected as their highest priority, 38 or so percent as their second, but still over half indicated this category as one of their top two priorities. And then if we look at public health programs, 20% uh, as their highest, 23 as their second, 44% total and as first or second priority. And then, oh, that was a typo. I'm sorry, the last category, the funding water, sewer and high speed internet, uh, that was a 40% as their first or second category with 
a quarter as their highest and then 15% as the second priority. Um, and then we also asked, uh, yeah, sorry, this one, this, this one they were asked to rank uh, their top five out of these categories. So as you can see, rent, utility, mortgage, again, top. And then childcare and healthy childhood services was also one of the top ones and drinking water projects, also extra pay for essential workers, high-speed internet projects. Uh, and then we also asked what, this was an optional question asking race or ethnicity. Um, so 81% were white, responded that they are identified as white, 13% didn't answer, oops. And then uh, about 2% were black or African-American, 2% Asian, 1.5% Hispanic or Latino, and then 0.8% were other. All right. Um, so that's my report. Oh, let me know if you have any questions. Any questions or comments? Uh, yeah. Um, for Go back to 4B. Okay, one second. Oh, I'm sorry, 4A, I think it was. This one? Yeah, so it's been a long time since I took a statistics, statistics class. Yeah. But it looks like a slight majority either had, were not affected or had slightly positive. If you add the last three categories together, right? A little over half um, actually, you know, it was either no, didn't affect them or it was slightly positive if you combine the two. Is that right? Um, let's see. So 38, 49. 55.8. Right. Um, I can review that. I, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's fine. You can review you it. You don't have to do that now, right? Yeah. Don't. Okay. Yeah. My apologies. <laughs> but you, generally, you, I did review it. Yeah. No problem, Tate. Anyone else? Lee? Yeah, I just, I, Tate, I want to thank you. Uh, this is just a really, really wonderful um, snapshot of the of the hard work that you've done. And I really appreciate it. I think, you know, the whole board probably does and, and the town. So thank you very, very much for doing this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tate. Mark, anything else? No, that's it, Steve. Thank you. Okay. Next is license and permits. It's the riveting part of the show. It's the annual license renewals. Um, Lee, do you want to start your motions? I do. Um, just one sec. Get all my fun stuff together. Steve or yep. Lee, we're going from the list that was emailed recently. Yes, we're, we're yeah. doing it by category. Okay. okay, so I will begin. I'm going to begin with the um, the license for the common victual or al all alcoholic license, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah. So is that right, correct? I'm beginning there? Correct. Okay, so I make a motion to approve the common victuallary. Could someone just say that word for me once? <laughs> no, no, no. It's... <laughs> Because I'm going to say this a lot. I can take all the fun out of it. <laughs> can I, can I uh, abbreviate that? Yeah, <laughs> it's the common common bick. Bick. You're just going to laugh the at me. The common vic or the common B. <laughs> okay, thank you. I make a motion to approve the common vic all alcoholic restaurant licenses of the following establishments with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. Um, James. A Modolo Post 8348 VFW Inc. GBFBP Inc. Four Brothers Pizza. 2001 Inc. Bo Bogies Restaurant. Agave's Mexican Grill LLC. AGZ Holdings LLC Cafe Adam. Batch 7 at 41 Inc. Manhattan Pizza. 
Berkshire Restaurant Group 3 Incorporated, number 10. Cove Bowling and Entertainment Incorporated. Chrissy Farm Catering Incorporated. ESPDM Inc. Baba Louie's Organic Sourdough. Fiesta Bar and Grill, LLC. IE Inc. JM Marcus Inc. Bizen. Koi Asian Gourmet Inc. Koi Chinese Restaurant. Kriya Vistra, sorry for mispronouncing that, LLC Asian Breeze. Uh, Manage uh, Raj, LLC Aroma Bar and Grill. Uh, Majake, Majake Inc. GB Eats. Moon Cloud, LLC. Rubner's Cafe. Schmaltz and Pfeiffer, LLC Market Plates Kitchen Table. The East Asian Cuisine, Inc., the East Asian Restaurant, the Well Restaurant and Bar, LLC, Thornwood Inn, Three Yanks and a Limey, LLC, Miller's Pub, Triplex Management Corporation, Inc., Triplex Cinema, Wood Anchor, Inc., Prairie Well, um, Gicotec Mexican Restaurant. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? These are all I just have a question. I don't, yeah. don't know what the IE ink is, please. If my memory serves me correct, it's butternut basin. That's correct. Thank you. You do this long enough, you remember these things, Garfield. <laughs> um, it's a roll call vote, Garfield. Aye. Eric. Aye. Ed. Aye. Lee. Aye. And I, it's unanimous. Continue, please. I make a motion to approve the common V all alcoholic in holders licenses of the following establishments or of the following establishment with the condition that the applicant satisfy all staff requirements. Berkshire Pleasure Hospitality LLC, the Barrington. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, Garfield. I do have a question. Sure. What are all the requirements, if you will? I don't know what they are. Mark? Like, yeah, well, I can just speak to that. It, it differs based on the type of establishment. But for, for example, if a restaurant still needs to submit a hood inspection to the building department, we would want the uh, license to be held until we receive that. Okay. So the different types of businesses have different requirements, but uh, we will as uh, you know, standard operating procedure here is that we'll hold those until uh, everyone, every department signs off. Thank you. Anyone else? Roll call vote, Garfield. Aye. Eric. Aye. Ed. Aye. Lee. Aye. And aye, it's unanimous. Continue, please. I make a motion to approve the Common Vic Wine and Malt Restaurant licenses of the following establishments with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. Berkshire Mountain Brewers, Brewers Incorporated, Barrington Brewery and Restaurant. Bazellions Fine Food Limited. Great Barrington Pizza House, Pizza House. Najee's Catering Incorporated, Science. <coughs> second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions? Comments? Hearing none, roll call Garfield. Aye. Eric. Aye. Ed. Aye. Lee. Aye. And I, it's unanimous. I make a motion to approve the Common Vic Wine and Malt Without Food license of the following establishment with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. Mahewi Performing Arts Center, Inc. Second. Any comments, questions? Seeing none, Garfield. Aye. Eric. Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. And I. Unanimous. I make a motion to approve the retail package all alcoholic licenses the following establishments with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. Big Y, Big Y World Market, World Class Market, number 22. Carjack Incorporated Plaza Package. Domaney's Liquors and Fine Foods, Gorman Norton Incorporated, Guido's Quality Fruit and Produce Incorporated, uh, 
Savvy Liquor Incorporated, A and B package and variety. Second. Any questions or comments? Roll call Garfield. Aye. Eric. Aye. Ed. Aye. Lee. Aye. And I, it's unanimous. I make a motion to approve the retail package wine and malt licenses of the following establishments with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. Brookshire Co-op Association Incorporated, Cooperative Association Incorporated, Brookshire Food Co-op, Rubiners, Cheesemongers and Grocers, LLC. Second. Questions or comments? Roll call Garfield. Aye. Eric. Aye. Ed. Aye. Lee. Aye. And I, it's unanimous. Go ahead, Lee. Okay. <laughs> I make a motion to approve the common VIC licenses of all the following establishments with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. So I'm just gonna read them all. Yes, please. 2001 Incorporated Bogey's Restaurant, I Shree 3 LLC, Agave's Mexican Grill LLC, Azteca Enterprises LLC, Tequerera Azteca. AGZ Holdings, LLC, Cafe Adam. Batch 7 at 41, Incorporated, Manhattan Pizza. Hindustan, Incorporated, Great Barrington, Sunoco. The Well Restaurant and Barn, LLC. Shiro Restaurant, Incorporated. Gorman Norton, Incorporated. Najee's Catering, Incorporated. Cumberland Farms, Incorporated. ESPDM, Incorporated, Baba Louie's Organic Sourdough. Uh, Manajra, LLC, Aroma Bar and Grill, Wyantana Country Club, JM Marcus Incorporated Bizon, Wood Anchor Incorporated Prairie Well, GBFBP Incorporated, Four Brothers Pizza, Fiesta Bar and Grill, LLC, Korea Vis LLC, Aegean Breeze, Three Yanks and a Limey LLC, Miller's Pub, Vivaldi's Pizzeria, Chrissy Farm Catering Incorporated, the Bistro Box, Great Barrington Pizza House, Pizza House, Koi Asian Gourmet Incorporated, Koi Chinese Restaurant, Berkshire Mountain Breweries Incorporated, Barrington Brewery and Restaurant, Chicotel uh, Mexican Restaurant, James A. Modolo Post, 8348, VFW Incorporated, Stockbridge Road Realty LLC, Fairfield Inn and Suites, Three is a Charm Incorporated, Windflower Inn, South Main Donuts, LLC, Dunkin' Donuts. Berkshire Restaurant Group 3, Incorporated, number 10. Lipton Incorporated, Lipton Mart, number 606. Price Chopper, number 155. Sav Savannah Liquor Incorporated, A&B Package and Variety. Berkshire Health Systems, Fairview Hospi Hospital Cafeteria. Big Y, Big Y World Class Market, number 22. Matt 1926 LLC, McDonald's number 2809. Thornwood Inn, Majake Incorporated G Beats, Schmaltz and Pfeiffer LLC, Marketplace Kitchen Table, Rubiner's Key uh, Cheesemongers and Grocers LLC, The Swedish Baker, IE Incorporated, Triplex Management Incorporated, Incorporated, Triplex Cinema, Cove Bowling and Entertainment Incorporated, Guido's Quality Food and Produce Incorporated, Berkshire Cooperative Association Incorporated, Berkshire Food Co-op, Bazellion's Fine Food Limited, the East Asian Cuisine Incorporated, the East Asian Restaurant, Husatonic uh, Five and Dime, Pleasant and Main, Moon Cloud LLC. Have a okay. second. I will uh, recuse myself from Berkshire Health Systems Fairview Hospital out of an abundance of caution because I work there. I don't make money from their vending machines or in their cafeteria, but I will vote on all the rest. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. And I, except for, for, for health systems. I make a motion to approve the weekday entertainment licenses of the following establishments with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. 
Berkshire Restaurant Group 3 Incorporated, number 10. 2001 Incorporated, Bogey's Restaurant. James A. Modolo, post, uh, post 8348 BFW Incorporated. Najee's Catering Incorporated. Fiesta Bar and Grill, LLC. Unitarian Universalist Ch Church of South Berkshire. Mahewi Performing Arts Incorporated. Thornwood Inn. Chrissy Farm Catering Incorporated. Berkshire South Regional Community Center. Weantanuck Country Club. St. James Place. Triplex Management Corporate, uh, Corp uh, Incorporated. Triplex Cinema. Guthrie Center. Berkshire Cooperative Association Incorporated. Berkshire Food Co-op. Chicotel um, Mexican Restaurant. Second. Discussion? Roll call, Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. And aye, uh, it's unanimous. Continue, please. I make a motion to approve the Sunday entertainment licenses of the following establishments with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. Mahewi Performing Arts Center Incorporated, Guthrie Center, Berkshire South Regional Community Center, 2001 Incorporated Bogies Restaurant, James A. Modolo Post 8348 VFW Incorporated, Fiesta Bar and Grill LLC, St. James Place, Triplex Management Corp Incorporated, Triplex Cinema. Second. Comments or questions? Roll call vote, Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. Uh, and I, it's unanimous. I make a motion to approve the in-holders licenses of the following establishments with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. Brookshire Pleasure Hospitality, LLC, the Barrington. Briar Bear, LLC, Briar Cliff Motel. Kanji Incorporated Holiday Inn Express. Thornwood Ood, uh, Inn. Three is a Charm Incorporated Windflower Inn. Wind in the Pines. Uh, Shamaje Incorporated Travelodge. Stockbridge Road Realty LLC, Fair, Fairfield Inn and Suites. Wainwright Inn LLC, Wainwright Inn. Second. Discussion? Roll call, Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. And I, unanimous. I make a motion to approve the amusement licenses of the following establishments with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. 2001 Incorporated Bogies Restaurant, Berkshire Mountain Breweries Incorporated Barrington Brewery and Restaurant. Second. Discussion? Roll call vote, Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. And I, unanimous. I make a motion to approve the motion picture licenses of the following establishments with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. Mahewi Performing Arts Center Incorporated, Triplex Management Corp Incorporated, Triplex Cinema. Second. Discussion? Roll call Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. Unanimous, I vote aye. I make a motion to approve the bowling license of the following establishment with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. Cove Bowling and Entertainment Incorporated. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. And I, it's unanimous. I make a motion to approve the class two licenses of the following establishments with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. Seven and 23 motor sales, All-Star Auto Salvage LLC, Formel Auto Salvage, DA Dempsey Auto Sales, Drecker's Auto Body Incorporated and Mechanic, JD, JD Automotive Incorporated, QJP LLC, Johnny's Garage, TireKickers.com LLC. Second. Comments, questions? Roll call, Garfield. Aye. Eric. Aye. Ed. Aye. Lee. Aye. And I, it's unanimous. I make a motion to approve the class three licenses of the following establishments with the condition that the applicants satisfy all staff requirements. DA Dempsey Auto Sales, Drecker's Auto Body Incorporated and Mechanic, QJP LLC, John's Auto Body. Second. Any discussion? 
Roll call Garfield. Aye. Eric. Aye. Ed. Aye. Lee. Aye. And I, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. New business. Request from Peter Puchalowski, attorney for the Community Development Corporation of South Berkshire 910 Housing Inc. and Wayfinders Inc. in accordance with section 10.4.8 of the zoning bylaw for good cause extension of special permit 887-18 issued November 26, 2018 for the work in the zone two of the water quality protection overlay district at 910 Main Street, Great Barrington. Uh, explanation. Uh, Hi. Um... Thank you. This is uh, the low and moderate income housing project at 910 Main Street. One of the inherent problems in this process is that you need all your local permits to apply for state funding and state funding is never quick. So you come to the end of your local permits and, and uh, you're still trying to get the money. At this point, uh, We've scheduled January 13 for a closing on financing on this. Um, the planning board has extended the 40R permit and conservation is extending the order of conditions. Uh, the problem here is we couldn't get in the ground during the initial term of a permit because the funding takes much longer. So we ask you to extend it for a good cause, that being that the way the order of business is on this, you couldn't get uh, to the point of exercising the permit until after it expired. So either Chris or Mark, when we, if we extend this for a good cause, should we put a time on it? Uh, Steve, I'm gonna open Chris's mic and see if he has any. Yeah, I see his hand up too, so thank you. Hi, this is Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi. Uh, well, I think Councillor Pusilowski's uh, email requested a six month extension to the end of June of 2022. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, yeah. So I think your motion, uh, if you're looking for a positive motion, would be to grant a good cause extension to June 30th, 2022. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to grant a good cause uh, approval through June 30th, 2022. I probably messed that up, but. No, that's correct. Okay. Do I have a okay. second? Discussion or questions? Seeing none, it's a roll call vote. Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. And I, it's unanimous. Thank you very much, attorney. Thank you. Next is the senior tax deferral program. Promote a few people here. Let's see. Phil Lorenstein is the chairman of the finance committee. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And okay, there I am. Um, can we um, be able to put up on the screen the, the packet that we provided on this topic? Um, I could do it from my computer if you could let me do it. Yeah, I can open uh, your permissions to do that. I, I don't have it in front of me. I just have the entire packet. So you should be all set to share mm -hmm. your screen. All right, so hopefully this will work. Are you seeing the share screen option? Uh, yep, just give me a minute. That work? Yes. Great. All right. Okay. All right. So 
a few just introductory comments. Um, the Finance Committee has spent a considerable amount of time uh, researching and deliberating the, the senior tax deferral. Uh, a great deal of this has included Vivian Orlowski, and we appreciate her and, and we appreciate her and thank her for her enthusiastic advocacy on this topic. Uh, the packet, which we have in front of you, uh, starts with a two-page bullet point memo that provides a brief overview of the program along with our recommendation. Uh, I'll go through it briefly, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions and discussion. Uh, there are various charts and schedules that I've provided in the packet, and we can refer to them as, as, as the group would like to. Um, in summary, the, the Finance Committee supports the availability of the Senior Tax Deferral Program for Great Barrington. The key question for the town is who should be eligible for the program. In other words, what should the income eligibility, eligibility test be? Who are we trying to help and what is the cost of that assistance? Uh, a bit of history, the deferral program is state law uh, and it was passed in 1974. About 160 towns in the state participate in the program while 190 do not. With the exception of some very small deferrals in Lee that happened several years ago, Berkshire towns have not used this program at all. Uh, we've had various conversations uh, and in particular with some of the other um, towns ab about this and anecdotal reasons that are mentioned are for the lack of participation is the complexity and the length of the application. Um, an important point is that is the need for the consent from your existing mortgage lender for the deferral. Obviously that can be a difficult thing to obtain. Uh, concerns over the impact of those who will inherit your home. And just, and probably very importantly is just a, a lack of awareness that the program even exists. Um, very, it's it's a, a bit of a, of a mystery in certain towns. So looking at the memo, I'll go through the bullet points quickly. Like I said, the deferral program uh, became Massachusetts law in 1974. Uh, since that time, there have been several amendments and there's extensive guidance that's been provided by the state and how to implement and manage the program. So the, the big picture there is that this is not a new program. We're not breaking any new ground here. Um, a property tax deferral does not eliminate the tax obligation like an exemption does. Instead, it defers the payment until a time when the eligible homeowner no longer owns the home, such as when it's sold, transferred to a trust, or the death of the owner. Um, deferred property taxes plus interest accrued during the years of the deferment must be repaid to the city or the town at that point. The program is fairly flexible in that seniors may defer um, any or all a part of their taxes owed each year, provided that as long as they must continue to qualify and the cumulative total of those deferred taxes, including the accrued interest, cannot exceed 50% of the fair cash value of the property as determined by the, access, by the assessor. So that's really the key limitation on how much you can defer. Repayment of the deferred taxes and accrued interest. Uh, the state guideline on the interest is 8% and we'll come back to that. Like I said, is due when the property is sold or the death of the owner, unless the surviving spouse continues to defer. As of the date of death, the interest accrues at 16%. That's a state law that cannot be changed. It does appear a bit onerous on paper, but that is, that is the requirement. Uh, the state has, has established eligibility criteria for the deferral and the town's a legislative body, our town meeting, can elect to modify those criteria within certain limitations. Um, in summary, the current eligibility criteria, and these are all, this is, there are, obviously there's extensive memorandum from the state on all of these criteria. But in summary, uh, this the criteria is you must be age 65 or older a resident of the state for at least 10 consecutive years and have owned the property for at least five years. Uh, then there's the income test. The resident's gross income or in income or gross receipts for the previous calendar year cannot exceed $20,000. And this income applies to either a, a couple or a single person. There are other 
senior tax benefits where there's separate rates for couples and singles, that is not the case for the deferral. And that, that's as specified by the state. And gross receipts include all income from all, all sources, including social security. There's no adjustments there. Like I said, the interest accrues at an interest rate of 8%, unless it's modified. And importantly, uh, any existing mortgage lender must consent to the deferral and the priority of the tax lien. The, the, the town is, would be getting a priority lien for these deferred taxes prior to the mortgage lien. So that's why the mortgage lender has to consent. And you know, that is why it is frequently the case that they would not consent to the deferral. Uh, number four, as we mentioned before, Great, Barring <clears throat> Great Barrington can vote at town meeting to modify these criteria. Uh, most importantly, that relates to the income test. The $20,000 gross income limit may be increased, and this is, an, according to the state, it may be increased up to the income limit allowed for the circuit breaker state income tax credit for a single not head of household. And that number as of this year is $62,000. So based on existing, based on current law, the town's option is to keep it at $20,000 or increase it up to $62,000 or any point in, in between. Some towns and examples are uh, Brookline, Newton and Sudbury, uh, they have requested and received state legislative authority for higher income limits and lower age criteria. So they've raised the income limits to approximately 80 or 90,000 in certain cases uh, and lower the age criteria to 60 in certain cases. Uh, that again requires um, state authorization uh, through the state legislative body. Uh, I think the finance committee took the approach that that was not, we were really here to analyze our options in the current law and any change in state law or requests for changes would be would something that would be coming from the um, select board and, and town meeting. Um, we have the option to move that interest rate to uh, keep it at eight or to move it at any, any rate below 8%. So we have a fair amount of flexibility there. So we, uh, as some of you may know, we've spent an enormous amount of time researching this point and discussing it at great lengths over, over the course of various meetings uh, at the Finance Committee. Uh, and we've taken a great deal of, uh, of public input on this. Um, in making our recommendation on the income limit, you know, we considered a wide variety of, uh, of information points, uh, input from the community, uh, reflecting on what we think is fair and not fair. We spent a lot of time looking at what other towns are doing. Um, and there's a, a wide array of data points there. Although we don't have the, the luxury of, of looking at what our neighboring towns are doing, because as I mentioned before, they're really just not participating in the program. So there's no clear uh, track record of, of, what, how about Berkshire, of how Berkshire towns are approaching the income limit test. Uh, we certainly spent some time thinking about a hypothetical couple, uh, a senior couple who are reliant on their social security income. Um, and we looked at scenarios there. Obviously, everyone will be has different benefits under the social security program. So it's, it's, you have to speak very broadly, but the nationwide average benefit, that's nationwide, which so it'll vary dramatically, uh, is about $18,600. So we spent, we pondered a, a couple who were both, for example, who are both receiving social security benefits and that's their sole source of income. Um, we did mention the, there was a, a, a different data point on the social security benefit that came up in a prior meeting, which was about 17,500. That's subsequently been updated you know, by the federal government and is now 18,600. So to conclude, so, the net of all that is the finance committee recommendation to the select board is for an income limit of $35,000 and an interest rate of 4%. Um, an important point there is, you know, we can, the select board can make these recommendations that can be approved at town meeting, and then we can elect in subsequent years to change those criteria. So we have flexibility to go back and change it 
based upon our experiences with the program. Um, you know, broadly speaking, that that made a fair amount of sense to the finance committee, given that you know we we have a it's very difficult to predict how this is going to go. Some observations is that, like I said, there is very limited capability and data to quantify the need among our residents for this assistance or to predict the volume of the applicants. Um, again, like I said, it's a it's a it's a complex program and and, and difficult to. Uh, uh, it may be difficult to get the approval of the mortgage lender. So, um, you know, typically towns have seen the applicants come in in relatively small numbers. Um, I, we've all been searching around for relevant data points that will help us understand the need and, and what makes sense in terms of how we set this test. And purely just for context, here are some facts that, that I would throw out there. Um, in Great Barrington, the federally funded heating fuel assistance program um, actually assists about 190 members of our community, but of that number, uh, 63 of them are seniors who own their homes. Um, that is a totally separate federally funded program providing up to about $600 of, of benefits in the form of credits against fuel bills. There is a cousin of this tax deferral program, which was referred to as 41C, which the town currently provides. And that is currently providing 16 seniors with a $1,000 property tax exemption. That's a full exemption, not a deferral. So happy to come back to that, but I'll, for, uh, those are a few data points. Um, it's important to note that while the program operates under established Establish state law, the usage of the program will require the time and resources from town staff, uh, in particular, um, Sue uh, and, and Ross Favori, our new assessor. And they have obviously, they've both been involved in our just conversations and our research so far, and any implement, implementation will require their time going forward. Uh, and, and in a similar vein, they continue to research a various open issues on very technical issues relating to implementation. How do, we, how do we deal with highly unlikely scenarios, but important to understand about what if a homeowner has an existing reverse mortgage? What if a homeowner has an existing federal tax lien? How would all that work? And we've been discussing that with Ross and Sue and they continue to work on that. Um, an important open point, probably from Ross's perspective um, is that, um, the, uh, the implementation timetable is, 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 is fairly complex in terms of if we go forward and people really wanna know when they can apply, um, we'll probably need some guidance from him on, on that timetable. And, and it's, it requires some research with the state. And we also have the nuance of people could apply under the old income test and people will wanna know justifiably when they can apply under the new income test to the extent it's approved at town meeting. Um, and just one last more general point, uh, you know, we've all done a lot of research on this topic. Um, you know, there is a relatively long list of existing proper, property tax exemption programs, uh, mostly targeted at seniors, and they all have different eligibility criteria, different application process, different requirements. They're fairly complex, um, you know, Taking a step back, I would I would suggest that at some future point the town can explore ways to provide more comprehensive guidance to the seniors and how to navigate these various options. Because we wouldn't want people who otherwise would want it and would qualify just to not do so because it's just, it's way too complicated or they don't they don't have good vision or they don't have good internet access or they just they just they find it overwhelming. So I think that that assistance would be would be helpful. Um, and, you know, that certainly relates to all of the other um, senior programs that are out there to assist seniors who are having financial difficulties. Um, so on that point, I'm going to stop. There's a lot of other information in here, um, but I think I'll stop to see if we have any questions and also to let the other members of the Finance Committee um, make their comments if they would like to. Any questions or comments from the select board? Yeah, I have a few. Yes, go ahead. And then Lee. 
a little more about uh, the, what it is the staff's researching. Um, is you you the staff the uh, you expect to have answers before May? I assume before we vote on this. Um, I'll take a stab at that. I I I, I the answer is yes. It really shouldn't hold up what we want to do here. These are. I would describe them as very technical points, uh, highly unlikely points. But if you asked us right now, if you asked Ross right now, if he had an applicant for the senior tax deferral who um, would, you know, would, would be eligible, um, but at the same time uh, had, a, had a reverse mortgage, you know, there was a little bit of ambiguity as to, as to the town's ability to say no to that for for the obvious reasons okay i mean i don't have a problem sending something not complete the town meeting as long as it's complete by the time it gets there yeah no, i wouldn't worry about that i think we're okay um the um staff time did he have an estimate uh, sue or hit or ross about how much i guess you don't know because you don't know how many people are applying correct yeah, I think it's unclear at this point until we, we have a better sense of how many people will qualify and apply. Uh, but I did open the mics for Ross and Sue if they have any any uh, comments to provide. I'll defer to Ross on that because I think it's going to be more of his time than in my area. Ross, you just have to unmute yourself. You're, you're good on our end. Mm -hmm. Sorry, how about now? There you go. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to say until we actually have an applicant that comes in. I mean, I think basically the majority of the time is just verifying, you know, the total income based on the information that we're going to require and then go ahead and, and processing it. I mean, it's a little bit difficult to say. I mean, only being that there's only two of us in the assessing office, but I'm sure we'll be able to handle it. I'm not overly concerned about it. But we won't know until we actually do one. Okay. Um, a, a couple, just a couple more quick ones. The if the the rate changes every year, does it change for the people who already have a loan out? No, that's a good that's a good question. If you if it we won't it won't change for the for the existing deferrals when you when so you defer, if I borrow at the four rate, right if we if, if somebody you, borrows at four percent, it right. stays four percent until they pay us back. But yeah, exactly. But if that individual then elects to defer in a subsequent Again. year, then they're locking in at that rate. Um, I, okay, I, I know the number is tiny, but um, if somebody is not paying $25,000 or five people are not paying $25,000 this year, the rest of the taxpayers are making up for it. Um, I, I, is there quick math? I mean, I think it's pennies, right? For, other, for the other taxpayers? Um, I know the calculation you're you're referring to, um, and I'm just going to that table. Um, yeah, I think you just passed it. Up. Yeah, I, I I know what you're saying. I I was reluctant to make that calculation because I think an important point is this is these are all totally made up numbers. Okay. Okay. So you know if we start if we start going down that calculation going down the road of that calculation, which is a very legitimate question, it implies that we know what we're talking about. Okay. And, and we don't, we don't know how many people are going to apply for the deferral and what the deferral amount would be. So I'm just very reluctant. I mean, we could certainly do it as a follow-up. We're happy to do the math. Uh, um, and, but, but it, it implies, it implies a predictive quality to this number that really isn't there. Okay. And then the last one's not really a question, but I'm going to throw it out now if it's okay, Steve. So that anyone who speaks can speak to it, which is, you know, I know at the finance committee you were nearly unanimous on the four percent. I think Michelle had suggested five percent. Um, at the rate of giving Michelle a heart attack, I think I agree with her. Um, uh, Realtor.com has home equity line of credit anywhere from three point seven five to six point seven five. Bank rate was similar, and it just seems to me with you know the the uh, Social Security has just raised the cost of living by 5%. I'm just concerned, lock, you know, locking into 4%. I, I feel a little more comfortable with 5 but we can debate that, and anybody can comment on that as we go. Thank you, Ed. It's going to be Lee, then Ann, then Eric. So, Lee, go ahead. 
Um, yes, thank you. I mean, part of my my question really was to Ross and to Sue um, about staff time because you know for me um, it feels very complex and you know I realize that town's not a bank <laughs> and so I you know I just I think about the um, the options that seniors have you know whether it's a reverse mortgage or or various other um, options that they could see at a bank so I, I just my thought is is just really on staff resources and time. And is it something that, you know, we have the capability uh, and wherewithal to, to to dive into? So that was my first um my first question. So I realize, Ross, you, you pretty much don't know, but you don't seem to be too too worried about this. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, like anytime somebody comes in for a senior uh, exemption, we ask them to bring in you know, paperwork, social security statements, pension statements, bank statements, things along those lines. I mean, it's going to be similar to that. They'll have to bring in that information. We'll have to review it, make sure that they meet the income requirements. You know, we can check and see, you know, what their status is as an owner. That becomes a bit complicated if they're in a trust and they're not the beneficiary of the trust. Sometimes that can be difficult to determine ownership. And I think that could actually take more time than than confirming income eligibility, mm -hmm. but it's a process that we're going to have to go through to make sure they meet the requirements as, as they are outlined. Do and like I say, until we do one, you yeah. know, we'll see. It depends how many we get. I mean, I, I don't think we're going to see that many of these things, but you never know. You know, it doesn't seem like it's been a real popular thing in a lot of other towns and we'll, we'll see what happens. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Sue so Carmel, do you want to just add before I go to Ann? I do. Thank you, Steve. Um, I was thinking as Lee asked that question again, that really we need to ask that question of the treasurer collector's office because someone's going to have to track what these people owe us um, from year to year. And obviously it's going to extend over multiple years in some cases. So I, I think that's something we have to consider that it may be more complex on their end to have to track that. Yeah. Yeah, and that was one of my my questions or concerns is, is really the long term um, effects of, of this. Mm -hmm. You know, tracking it and, and you know different staff members turnovers, different boards, different you know votes. Um, and again, you know, because we're not a bank, I, I just worry: are we set up to 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 really take this on? So, thank you. Um, let's go with Ann, then Eric, then Garfield. Thank you, Steve. Um, I guess I just wanted to comment about I, I mean I recognize it's time to it takes time to set it up and get all the systems working but somebody could walk into our offices today or tomorrow I guess tomorrow we're closed today and say you know I'd like to participate in this program and I meet the income eligibility and the residential eligibility so and it's a program that my understanding is that the state makes available to anyone who's resident of Massachusetts so we would have to do it anyway um, and so I do think, you know, this chance to sort of explore how is it that we can make this doable is, is worth our time. And I guess I also just want to say, I guess I just want to say a few words about how we came up with the 40,000. And I, I, I will admit I struggled with the 4% as well um, in terms of the interest rate and for exactly the reasons um, that you noted. I mean, the 40,000 we came up with, as Phil noted, because you know, the 20,000, even for one person who's on a very limited income, they would, they would exceed that most likely. They would probably go above it. So we felt it wasn't going to make it possible for just about anybody to participate. And we felt that 40,000 was a good compromise between the very low state lowest uh, maximum income limit and some of the higher limits we saw in, in other towns that's, that have far more staff resources than we have and far higher um, property values and median family incomes. Um, so I just wanted to give a sense of why we came up with that. Um, and again, we said 35, and that was 35,000, correct? So, so. Thank so you. I, I just wanted to clarify um, that I got the 40,000 wrong, it was 35,000 was our recommendation. Eric. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I guess I got a couple parts to my questions and uh, concerns. Um, so 
the part about the 16% that cannot be uh, changed, the, that interest rate of 16%, that's basically the same rate as say a credit card or something, is is that divided between the state and the town or, or the, how is that, how do they come up with that number? And does that all stay to the town or since the state says you can't change it, is the state getting a piece of that? No, that, yeah, that's, that's a good question. The state is not getting a piece of that. Uh, it's yeah. all going to the town. I mean, I think the, you know, based on the research we've done, I think that the concept is that they really want people to pay this off quickly when, 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 the, when the homeowner passes away. It's not yeah. meant to remain in place after that point in time. So is that a high rate? Does that pop out as being quite high? I, I certainly agree. Um, it's obviously, it came from a different era. Um, but I think the, the, the main uh, takeaway there is that the state really wants people to pay this off promptly upon the transfer of the property. It's not meant to hang around as sort of a, a financing option at that point. But I guess if, if, if you know, whoever was inherited or, or left the property, obviously that interest can get out of control quite quickly. And in a sense, I guess my concern would be just the imagery of the town of Great Barrington taking somebody's family property, you know? So, which I guess goes back to me being concerned. I don't, this, this is a great program and, and I wanna help all the seniors we can. Um, but I, I don't know that I wanna make this the most attractive option uh, that's out there. And, and I guess that as far as I'm concerned with the 4% rate um, and, and, and us, and like Lee said, we're not really a bank. So at the end of the day, I, I also think I would feel better if we started off with a higher rate and then see how things work out. And, and if it's not used commonly, I just kind of worry about the imagery of you know, the 16% if something was to happen and, and it being everybody's first choice as opposed to going to a bank and sorting that out where they could get better rates and better terms probably, you know, so. Well, if I can just make a brief reply point, I, I, those are very good points. I would say that, again, the 16%, 16% that we just don't have the option to, to change that is, is our understanding. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, from a process standpoint, you know, there's no, it, it's extremely unlikely that the town will be foreclosing on anyone. It's really a case where when the, when the property is transferred, then the, 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 the recipients of the, the people who inherit the house or buy the house, the town has to get paid back before that transfer is effective. So that's, that's the way I'd look at it. So it's part of the closing, the closing table there. Um, in, in terms of the rates, um, one thing I would say is, is that the rate and the eligibility criteria work together in that the lower the eligibility criteria on the income side, then the more the less likely that those individuals or that couple is going to be trying to arbitrage or sort of make money off the town by using the deferral program. I mean, a, a senior couple who are barely getting getting along on social security, it's highly unlikely that they can't get any kind of mortgage out mortgage products out there. Maybe a a subprime uh, a reverse mortgage, but but their options will be few if, if any. Uh, when you start increasing the income eligibility criteria, then you can make an argument that those couples would have more options to do things privately on their own in terms of a home equity loan or a reverse mortgage. And therefore, the possibility that they may be just sort of trading off rates with the town and their bank is more likely. So the two things kind of work together. Okay, thank you. Garfield? Yes, hi, thanks. First of all, I want to thank the uh, Finance Committee for doing the work that they've done. Um, and I want to thank Ann for making the, the, uh, the, or pointing out that this work would have to be done anyway, uh, as far as the, is it being so called complex, being very complex. I have to admit, I don't know all the financial aspects. I look at it a lot for myself 
and a moral point of view and how we are as a town and the people that live in this town have made this town have been here a long time. And we do have the resources, I think, to handle this long term. As Ann said, it has to be done. Um, Ross says he doesn't believe it would be a, a, a big issue. Um, I know Vivian has done some extensive homework. You can probably speak to it. Um, I can only say that from gathering and speaking with her that this is not something that's going to cost the town a lot of money. Um, complexity should not be a reason for not doing something. Um, anything that's worth doing is usually complex and, and, and takes a little work. There's nothing good is easy. Um, I think 4% is, is a great idea. Again, we are not a bank, but I think these are people that probably would not go to a bank. As I remember speaking with Stephen, I think personally, and this is again my feeling, I think I'm going to feel a lot more secure knowing that this is my town. This is backing me. They're going to stick behind me. I'm not going to worry about it, like maybe at a bank. Again, I know we're not a bank, but I don't see a problem with us offering at 4%. Uh, it, it, it's very reachable. It's doable. I think if it, you can always go up, it's harder to go down. And I think we should st stick at that. And also remember when, when I've watched a lot of the finance committee, I know you have recommended 35, but I know you've also spoke that you thought 35 to 40 was something that you were throwing out. And I think 40 to K, uh, as you might have read in that letter back then, when they started as 20 K uh, was the uh, barometer. Now uh, 20 K um, looks like 42,000 plus in, in, in 2021. So I think 40,000 isn't too much to ask. Um, so again, I feel it's a good program. I think it's something that we should do. I may even take advantage of it myself. Um, I don't see it, uh, it being a, a detriment if it, people want to maybe seek this out first. Um, these are people that have lived in our town uh, probably longest or, or have, have uh, and grown up here. I want to stay here. Uh, this makes it possible for a lot of seniors. There are other options, but some of the options may not be available to them or they're not able to take those options. This might make it easier. The paperwork that has to be done is always difficult, no matter if you're doing it with Social Security or not. It always takes a little work. Thank you, Bill. Lee. Thank you. Um, Phil, could you just um provide the number of of a couple both on social security again what what it is right now uh well again it's uh, let me be clear what that number is and what it isn't you know but all, roughly. all it represents is just the nationwide average benefit okay individual yeah is eighteen thousand six hundred. okay per, per person you know, a hypothetical couple is two times that number but again it, we we know it's always going to be different uh, mm -hmm. It's going to be for a wide variety of reasons, but we're just just using that as a as a yeah. rough rough starting point. I mean, I, I you know I I really don't want anyone to be left behind. I I would hate for seniors to to feel the stress that are are just barely getting by and and have no place to go. So I want to make sure that we provide an ability for for seniors to to keep their house for that reason. Um, but I do want to make sure that they have the best options and they're where are the best options that, you know, possibly working with the bank might be better than going to the, to the town. So I would just hope that we, whatever we decide that we would be able to provide some guidance without, you know, putting too much, um, too much extra work on our tax collector and to, and to Ross at the moment, you know, providing guidance of, of some of the options, because um, I think there are options and, you know, th this should really be the last, the last option. And um, so it's that kind of finding that sweet spot. And um, so, you know, I, I think it's the right thing to do. I'm just trying to find the sweet spot. Vivian Orlowski, very briefly. Um, th uh, thank you, Steve. Um, I just want to clarify something that I interviewed um, assessors and associate assessors at several towns that have been doing this for a number of years. And they all stressed that the application process and reviewing the application was really very simple for them. 
for the applicant, it does involve uh, clearing any other uh, outstanding uh, mortgages or any other uh, trusts or things like that. But that time falls on the applicant, not on the assessor's office. So for example, the associate assessor in Newton, where they have the highest number of exemptions in the whole state, uh, 69 exemptions, he said that it takes him about half an hour to, to, re to review an application. Um, currently, our assessor's office um, reviews, um, according to the uh, data from the finance committee, it reviews um, a number of, was it 16 of um, actual exemptions where the town forgives a certain amount of the taxes. And those applications involve having to check assets as well as income. Uh, the deferral does not check assets, it only checks income. So there's much less work for the assessors. So I, um, I, I agree with Ross, who, who seems to have a more, um, how to put it, um, realistic view of, of what this will mean. It could mean some extra work. I mean, there will be applications, but the, the fears ex ex expressed by some members of the uh, select board uh, really don't jibe with uh, what other towns told me, for example, the town of Norwell, they have 11,000 people, they get between six and eight applications a year. There are two people in the assessor's office for a town of, of 11,000. So they can manage with two people in the assessor's office. So I hear again, I don't think it would be an extra burden uh, on them. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Garfield. Yes, I just wanted to reiterate what Vivian's saying. I think it would not be an extra burden. Um, and the reason why I say this, it it's, could be part of the uh, job description, if you will, when you're giving uh, something to do at your job, that's what you do. Lee. Um, a question on uh, not checking assets. So are you saying that someone could have quite a, um, a hefty amount of assets and, and that's not factored into this? Ross, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I, I think they're not looking at assets like, you know, as far as counting your home and things along those lines. It's strictly based on income. Right. Total income for the for the for the property. But if if they owned other property and had other, you know, maybe it wasn't liquid, but if they had, you know, property elsewhere, I mean, does that take into account that they could sell off property to to pay for this? You know, this if it was generated income, we'd look at it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not, you know, it, it's not the, the, the various programs for these property tax exemptions in this program, they're all unique and they all have different tests. And like Vivian said, some include assets and some don't. So it, it's hard to sort of figure out, you know, it, it's not logical how they all kind of work together, but, but Vivian uh, it is correct that it doesn't look at assets. Do um do we know if reverse reverse mortgages look at? I'm just thinking the options for people. So if do we know that the options that um, banks offer, do they look at assets or is it just? Well, I, I I'm I'm just speculating, right? Yeah. So we don't know exactly what they're going to look at, but I would say yes, they would. Um, and I would say that uh, in my in my opinion, we we we've spent a lot of time on this very extreme hypothetical scenario where an, uh, an individual would have a reverse mortgage and then also seek, seek a deferral. I, 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 don't, uh, I don't think that would happen. And uh, it's, it's, just, it's, it's not particularly, uh, again, it's extremely unlikely. Um, I don't know if that, maybe you weren't asking that, but I think that's also a relevant point. So it se seems to me, you know, I'm in favor of the senior tax deferral. I think we, we already offer it, but I think we should publicize it. And I think we should change the parameters. And, and I think starting at a, an area where we're comfortable so that we're not inundated, which I don't think we would be anyways, uh, the 35,000 makes sense. Um, the finance committee did a lot of work and I respect the 4%. I'd probably be more comfortable with five, but I respect that. What we're doing tonight, if so if we so choose is to make a recommendation, uh, accept their recommendation and send it to the town meeting. And ultimately the taxpayers are the one who's gonna vote on this. So I, I was at almost all the finance committee meetings and this was well thought out. So 
Do I have a motion from someone? Yeah. Can I say something before Lee makes the motion? Yes, and then Garfield's got his hand up, so yes. Okay, just be, I'm sorry, you want to Garfield first? No, no, you can go ahead. It's just because I've heard it from three of us. Um, I, you know, I, I kind of agree with Lee. I don't want us, I want us to be the last resort, um, which is why I prefer 5%. Um, so if a 4% motion is given and fails, I will be supporting a 5% motion. But I, so I don't know how Lee wants to do it. Yeah, is this a discussion or are we voting? We can discuss. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm feeling the same urge to, to go for 5% and just to say, to, to start with something um, because it can always be changed. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable going with the finance committee um, recommendation, but I, my gut reaction is, is to, to kind of play it safe at least for one year so we get a sense if, if we're close to the sweet spot um, and adjusting it. So that's, that's my um, inclination, but... There is a, um, I think there's a motion. Was yours a motion, Steve, for 4%? No, well, there hasn't been a motion. Oh, there's, we're still in discussion. Okay. Yep. Garfield uh, has his hand up, so I'll let Garfield go. Right. I, I just feel adamantly that 4% would be fine. I don't see why we need to think we need to tax these people on one more percent. Uh, 4%, I think, is, is not unreasonable. It's not too low. Again, like everything else works in this world. If it's too low, it will go up just like everything else. Nothing goes down. So let's start at the base. And then again, as uh, when you go to the grocery store, what you bought meat for last week cost more this week. So let's look at it that way. Let, let, let's look at it as 4% to start. And if we need to, we can go higher as it's, everything else does in the world. It just it seems like there are three of us who like 5% and one who would would have liked it had the finance committee said it. So Eric, I'm curious about Eric's. Eric's quiet. <laughs> I don't want you to get get away from this. <laughs> Put you on the hot no, I, I I guess the way I would look at it is is I would feel good if we started it this year at five percent. I would say, and, and and like all things in banking and in loans, they do fluctuate. They they do go up. They do go down. Um, I'm on the cautionary side. Um, I would like to ease in with this. I'm good with the 35%. Uh, I would feel better if it was at 5%, to be honest with you. So do I have a motion? I'll make a motion that we set the terms at the finance committee, said amend the, uh, or leave the 4% as is and, and make the, uh, 35,000, 40,000. Okay, so Garfield's recommendation is 40,000 and 4%. Do I have a second? I do not hear a second. Do I have another motion? Um, you want to do it, Lee? Uh, sure. Um, I make a motion to uh, for the senior tax referral to set a rate at 5% with the income limit at $35,000. Do I have a second? I'll second it for discussion. I wouldn't have a problem with 40, which is keeping up with inflation. Um, I don't know how others feel. Well, we'll find out when we vote, won't we? I, I, I guess I'd hate to vote this. Does, does anybody want to say if they would prefer? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to make it so it helps. So I don't want to say it's so low that it, it's not helpful. So I, I guess, could I ask Philip um, 35%, I mean, or $35,000, is that not... You know, I, again, I don't want to make it the engine well, eligible. Again, we're, so we're kind of, yeah. This is, we, we had these conversations in the finance committee. Yeah, yeah. We're sort of walking around in the dark a bit. I mean, yeah. again, the I wouldn't focus too. I, you might be thinking about two times eighteen thousand six hundred. Yeah, yeah. The reality yeah. is that you know, uh, you and I are not receiving the benefits, so we we don't know. But you'll have you'll typically have the uh, one individual of a married couple receiving. The full benefit and then the spouse may be receiving a smaller benefit so i only say that just just so to make it less significant the, the two times eighteen thousand six hundred. that that is just sort of a very broad guideline as, as what the benefit what social security benefits are okay. the reason i'm leaning towards 40 is because that's the you know the cost of living from when it was 20 would now be 40. um i'll vote yes for whatever you Proposed. Um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll,
again, I will state as Lee just noted, she said she doesn't want to make it so people can't uh, use the benefit. So and I'm saying, well, let's make it so they can and make it a 4%. I don't know why we're getting hung up thinking we're a bank. We're not a bank. We know that. Let's think of people. And Lee, I'm, I'll say it. I'm very surprised at you. That, that, that's what you say, because so this is a people issue. And I'm thinking people. And I think 4% makes it much easier for people. So I'm, I'm very surprised at that. So I think there's a balance in our field between the town and the, the people. And I do not think that five is so onerous or 35 is so onerous that it would discourage people. Um, and I think, to be honest, after listening to the finance committee, with all due respect, they were walking around in the dark for three or four meetings. They, they did their best and they, it was very good, but they will be the first ones to tell you that it's not all scientific. It's just things not. Uh, Phil, would you agree with that? No, I, I uh, thank you. I, I would definitely agree. I mean, we, the key is it, in a perfect world, we would have, um, uh, you know, a, a, a full spreadsheet of all of the incomes of our residents who are senior citizens, and we can make a very scientific assessment of who we wanted to help and who we felt, felt shouldn't be eligible for the program, but we, we don't have that information available. So that's why we, uh, again, we're trying to be, we're trying to be open and honest where we're walking around in the dark. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. and, and it's important. I, one last thing, and I'll, I'll shut up is, I think we always had sort of a, a overriding tone in our conversation that, hey, you know, we don't know how this is going to work. We don't know the interest in the program. So why don't we do it for a year at some middle of, middle of, the, middle of the range type of criteria and see how that goes. I think if we have specific information of a list of seniors who applied and were just over our eligibility criteria, then my sense is we would all support modifying the criteria to help those people out. We're not trying to, you know, cut people off who need the help. We're trying to absolutely us understand that's where the need that. is. And we mm -hmm. sort of have to start somewhere. And that's how we got to our recommendation. Yeah. Thank you, Phil Lee. Um, so, so I absolutely agree. I, th I think we need to start somewhere. And by all means, I think we need to make this uh, something that will help people. So, and it's really that kind of going between, you know, the, the, between two stools until we have the data. Um, and I think, you know, once this is, is, is starts, we'll be able to get a good sense of, you know, are we losing people because of $5,000 or a percentage point? So um, I, I would like to withdraw my motion, though. Um, and make a new motion if, if the- I'll withdraw the second, go ahead. Okay, go ahead, Lee. Um, I'd like to make a motion that um, we uh, set a 5% interest rate with a $40,000 income um, uh, limit. Do I have second. a second? Second. So motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Yeah, I, well, hold okay. on. What, what is, I'm not quite sure how I would vote if I agree with half of this, the, the Lee's um, edict, if you will. H how does that, I don't know how to, how to work that. Um, you can't vote in a half. So you, you'd either right. say, you either say it's a good compromise, I'll vote for it. Or you say, I'm still not comfortable and you vote against it. Okay, thank you. That's how I would look at it. Okay. Okay, um, did we lose Ed? Well, kind of I'm here, my battery's dying. I'm trying to plug it in. Okay, good, as long as I still have you there. So roll call vote. So, and this is at 40 at 5%, just so everyone's clear. Garfield. No. Uh, Eric. Aye. Ed. Aye. Lee. Aye. And no, it passes three to two. So it does pass. Thank you very much, everyone. Good spirited to me. Okay, next we have the Housatonic Assistant Committee. Let me promote some people here. Mark will help me.
So this is the Houstonic Improvement Committee Charette presentation. I have, hopefully I have Dan somewhere. There he is. Yeah, and here. Angela, I don't see, um, is there anyone else, Dan, besides Angela and you? We're, we're the only two that are presenting. I, I okay. don't know who else is on. Yeah, I don't, that's fine. Okay, go right ahead. All right, uh, again, thank you board for um, giving, the, giving us this time tonight. I know it's been a long meeting, um, but I certainly appreciate the time kind of review what we've come up with um, for a proposal for the Houstonic School after our um, design charrette that happened about a month and a half ago. So just to kind of a recap of what's happened in Mark, and if you can go to the next slide, um, next couple slides right up to the executive summary, that would be great. There we go, thank you. Um, as, as you were well aware and as the public is aware, um, the Houstonic Improvement Committee was formed in December of um, 2019 with our first meeting in June of 2020. Um, and the main goal was to foster the social and cultural well being of Housatonic. Over the year and a half, the committee explored and examined many existing documents, including the town's master plan, uh, Berkshire Blueprint 2.0, Housatonic Vision, Visionary Report of 2004 the Housatonic Task Force of 2011 report, current zoning issue or current, current zoning bylaws, um, the past RFPs and Gray House uh, Partners proposal, which was the latest um, proposal that happened several, about three years ago. Um, examining all those documents, we came up with a um, some I, some uses that we felt would uh, kind of um, <laughs> go along with all those reports and kind of summarize those reports. We found that there was many uses that were kind of held true through the years over the last 17 years. And we kind of put those uses together and listed the assistance of the Western Massachusetts AIA, which is American Institute of Architects, to organize a design charrette. Um, we presented those uses as well as the same packet that we had been working off of to, to the group, to the Western Mass AIA group. And on October 30th, five volunteer architects got together to um, perform a design charrette um, during which time they kind of went through the process. A couple of them toured the school. Um, they kind of decided to go at this as a group approach to come up with um, some schematic or some very basic designs. Um, and Mark, if you want to kind of roll to the designs, we'll kind of go into those. So they came up with essentially two concepts with the basement and first floor being the same in both concepts. The difference was the third floor where they, where they included uh, residential spaces. Um, and the net, and if you go one more slide, Mark, we can see that there are a couple more slides actually to the, to the top floor, if you will. Perfect. Just tell me when to stop, Dan. Yep, that's good, right there, thank you. So this is the first option, which, which includes uh, four, bed, four two bedroom apartments, one, uh, I'm sorry, three one bedroom apartments and one studio apartment. Um, this would in, entail the whole um, of the whole top floor, um, second floor or third floor, however you're looking at it. And if you go one more slide for me, Mark, this was the alternative to that, which would include six two bedroom units. Um, now, if you kind of roll back um, all the way back to the basement plan, if you don't mind, Mark. I'm sorry, back to what? Yes, back, back to the basement plan, uh, two more slides. One more, thank you. So the basement, um, which, which is again, um, thought of as usable space 
would be uh, potentially supporting any tenant spaces, but it would also have the potential for a commercial kitchen as well as some other um, public spaces if needed, as well as um, restrooms if needed. Now, if you go ahead one more slide, Mark, that brings us to the first floor, um, in which would all be kind of a uh, commercial space as needed. You can notice that um, the architects all did decide that a um, elevator would be needed. If there's any kind of public space, it would be required to have it for handicap accessibility. So the bottom floor basement and the first floor would require a elevator stop. It was discussed that for a small amount of increase in cost, the third stop to the second floor could also be considered. Um, if the third floor remains all residential, it is not required to have the elevator to go to that point. Um, so again, I'm gonna, at this point, I'm gonna kind of turn it over to Angela to kind of di discuss some of the financial aspects that we kind of looked at out, that came out of the charrette. Okay, thanks, Dan, and thank you to the select board. Um, I am going to very briefly run through the financial projections, and I'm also going to give you some corrections that need to be made to the narrative, and I'll be very um, careful about telling you where that happens. Um, so I think everyone should know that the town has $600,000 in designated funds for this building. Uh, my understanding is that it's for the envelope of the building, which would be roofing and windows. And then the town is also named the responsible party to abate any hazardous materials in the building. So those two things are already sort of committed by the town. Um, we feel like there may be other funds available through grants or various sources that the town has, community development block grants, community impact funds, the community preservation act and the um, ARPA funding. Um, so that's something that the, the select board will have to talk about. Let me tell you about some of the assumptions we made to make these financial predictions. First, we decided to um, use the interest rate of 2%, which is what the town can borrow money, um, the rate that the town, uh, at which the town can borrow money. And we developed this chart showing um, borrowed amounts between $2 million and $7 million, and what the debt service um, that would correspond to those amounts would be. And then we projected some rentals just from the residential housing. So in the option one floor plan, um, if we assumed that we were charging rent at 80% of the area median income, so that they would be affordable. And we assume that only one person was renting even a two bedroom, just for discussion purposes. The um, rents per month would equal a total of $9,400. Again, if there was a mix of numbers of people in each apartment, one, two, three, or four people, the rents would be higher than that. In option two, with the six two bedroom apartments, um, again, with using only one person in a two bedroom apartment, um, the, rent would, uh, the rents would generate $7,050 per month. Um, if there were three persons living in each apartment, their rents would be $9,060. So the estimated income from the residential portion of this building, and here's where our change comes into the narrative, would be between $7,050 a month to 9,400 a month, okay? Then if we go to floors, um, the basement level and the first floor, and we look at the various different meeting spaces, um, we used rental rates that are based on um, a very reliable source, um, appropriate to Housatonic, and we used those numbers to generate the monthly rentals for various spaces based on their square footage. Um, underneath that chart, um, excuse, go, go to the next slide, Mark, if you would. Um, uh, 
interesting. Okay. We're missing some narrative here. Um, okay, I'll just keep on going. So um, in this chart, we're using every space that the architects enumerated and the square footage price at different rental uh, rates per foot, $15 generally, and then $8 a square foot. And we come up with $5,794 and change from the non-residential portions of the building. What we didn't project out is what the kitchen slash food preparation area could generate. So if we take the 5794 and we add it to the 9400, the building could generate around $15,000 a month, which um, falls in between a four and a $5 million um, loan amount. So it could carry between four and $5 million. Um, we're hopeful that um, based on our numbers and certainly more work has to be done, that this will look like a viable project. Um, we are not sure whether the town will take this on. It may make sense to do that or if it would be a partnership with uh, a private developer. Um, we didn't get into that kind of decision making, but we are looking at what we assume to be a renovation cost at $350 a square foot, which would mean it would be around a $7 million project. Um, and we'd love to see it happen for the, the village of Housatonic. I'd like to just open the floor for questions about the financial predictions. May I? Let me just ask, are you done with the presentation so we can take it? I'm, I, I can re, I can cap it off with our, our actual official recommendations in a couple So why, why don't you do that before we take questions? Okay. Um, excuse me, Mark, if you just want to fast forward to um, our recommendations, thank you. So these are our official recommendations. Um, and as Angela mentioned, we, we are recommending that the select board require that either through an RFP or um, as part of a deed that that some portion of the building remain in public use. Um, we, rec we recommend that the RFP re reflects the design charrette and keeps the historic integrity of the building. We recommend that the select board acts proactively to promote the availability of the building, uh, both prior to and during the RFP process. And then which kind of leads us to a path forward where what's going, what we envision seeing happening with this, um, first and foremost, would probably be the um, phase two environmental um, is, as soon as we could get a scope and a, um, the funds were available to kind of start that. We do know that the town is on the hook for any kind of environmental remediation that would need to be need to happen in the building. Uh, the town will actively identify and pursue potential grant fundings for the renovation. Again, this would be to help um, defer any costs that that might um, so we don't have to put anything else on the taxpayers. Um, the town will move forward with um, securing the roof with tarps and boarding the windows. I do believe that money has been allocated for that and you guys are in the process of that. Um, and then in the event that this does not generate what would be an acceptable proposal um, we do ask that the select board bring it back to the Housatonic Improvement Committee um, prior to um, putting a final stamp on demolition of the building. And again, that's just so we can chime in as, as part of our charter um, to, to foster the social and cultural well-being of, of Housatonic, just so we can weigh in one more time on the property. Um, and then finally, also, it should also be noted that the select board has made this commitment and the, the Housatonic Improvement Committee has also been hearing the same thing that that the, the building lot should remain the building lot and that the, the sledding hill and the park should not be disturbed or even considered during any part of any RFP or uh, any sale of the property. And it should also be noted because the question comes up a lot that there have been parking studies done that do show um, that some parking can be feasible there. Um, obviously, a more in-depth 
um, parking study would have to be done when the actual uses would be determined. That's, that's what we have for our presentation. Um, I, I do believe at this point, we will open up the questions from you and do the best we can to answer them. Sure, go ahead, um, Ed. Yeah, well, first, obviously, um, thank you. <laughs> I've been to most of your meetings and I know how much work you guys put into this. Um, I did I have a question on the numbers. Um, the estimate was it's most likely to be in the $7 million range. Um, so I'm not a developer. The difference between rent and what it'll pay for that um, seems significant. Yes, did, did I miss something in there? Yeah, um, Ed, based on the projections we used, and they're very conservative, um, the building um, could generate about 15,200, let's say a month, which, right. would, which would float between a $4 million and a $5 million project. And we estimate that the total cost to renovate and bring the whole building up to code would be $7 million. Now, keep in mind that the town has the 600,000 and has to remediate the hazardous uh, materials. So let's just say that's a million and a half. So right. if we take the million and a half and add it to 4 million, which is low, um, then uh, the gap, uh, so that would be five and a half million, the gap is a million and a half dollars. Okay, does, thank does you. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. Uh, I have someone with their hand up that says the town of Great Barrington. So I'll let them talk then, Lee. Thank you, Steve. I'm sorry, this is Patrick Barrett. I was not able okay. to change my name. I'm signed in. From That's fine. I, I was looking for you to, <laughs> to recognize. Uh, I just, I just want to point out that the, the version of this report that Mark is sharing somehow is not the final version that I sent to Amy late last week. So there's some uh, numerical and uh, narrative differences between what what's shown and uh, and what the final version is. If you don't have that, I'm happy to resend it to whoever needs it. But uh, but that's the previous version. Okay, I appreciate that, Patrick. Sure. Lee, thanks. Uh, thank you very very much, uh, Houstonic Improvement Committee. I absolutely um, appreciate all the hard work that you've put into this. Uh, question on timeline: um, What what kind of timeline are you guys hoping for? Because you know, ultimately the RFP will go out, and then we'll hopefully get some developers that step up, or some some businesses or organizations that are interested. So, are we prepared to wait? You know, three months, six months, a year, um, and at what stage then do we do we consider other options? Well, I I think to answer your first question, I I think we're we're looking for the the select board to kind of move on this as fast as you guys can. Yep. Um, obviously, there's certain limitations there, um, and honestly, I I think that's kind of on you at this point, Lee, as to what you guys feel comfortable putting out there for a time frame is how long the RFP process is. Well, I know right. it's that's us. I was just wondering if you had that discussion, if it's kind of one of these points that we would say, okay, you know, it's been out there and we haven't gotten any responses, um, you know, go to, go to, you know, option two. Yeah, I think that's, that's our choice. That's our yeah, I was choice. just wondering if, if the HIC had, you know, discussions about that, but. Um, hey, Angela has her hand up, literally. Yeah, so I think it would be really helpful if it's possible to have a joint meeting with the Housatonic Improvement Committee make sure Chris Remble is in the room and the select board because um, he and I, he and Dan and I met and we talked about how this could roll out. And I think there are more possibilities than just an RFP. Um, and I don't wanna get into that because it's a whole nother discussion, but um, you know, given that we have a loose plan and something that looks like it could be viable, I think we should start talking about how it could work pretty quickly. So the next step will be that we'll ask Mark and Chris to come back with an executive summary. And that could include in there, we'll invite the Housatonic Improvement Committee and we'll do that as soon as they can get that out, which is, I think will be fairly quick, but that'll be the next step. So um, briefly, I'll allow a few people to talk. Charlie Williamson. Yeah, can you hear me, Steve? Yes. All right. Um, I heard the rent was going to be like $780. So let's round that off to $800 a month. 
Uh, does this also include the electric to the apartment, the uh, heat to the apartment, and the town sewer to the apartment? Because uh, people who are on town sewer, they roughly pay about uh, $500 a year for town sewer. Are the tenants going to be paying for their town sewer, the heat and the electric, or is the town going to be picking up this uh, this expense? I think this concept, Dan Kerr or Angela, correct me if I'm wrong, is not that detailed yet. They've handed us a, a con conceptual plan that we need to to go deeper into, Charlie. So it's a good point, but it yep. there's no answer yet. I, I just thought $800 a month rent isn't covering some of these items. You're probably right, but we haven't gotten that far yet. We're, we're still in the conceptual stages. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Um, Bill Orenstein. Yes, uh, thanks for all the work on this. I know that this is a, in its concept status, but um, has the committee considered making the entire building residential as opposed to mixed use? Uh, just just on, on the basis that there may be more interest or demand for you know, apartments as opposed to the commercial space. Phil, if I may, that, that kind of goes back to the history of, of the last 17 years of this. Um, most reports in, in, that have been done on the building, including some of the visionary studies and the task force studies that all included um, community surveys, even though they, they are maybe outdated, if you will, all the sentiment is that nobody wanted full residential. I think part of that is to satisfy some of the community, what the community has wanted and balance what um, other potential uses as well too. Okay, no, I, I hear you and I appreciate that that history. Uh, I, obviously you'll, you'll, if you do an RFP, you'll see what interest you get back and mm -hmm. how, where that will take you. Thank you. So is the board satisfied with our next step, which will be asking Mark and Chris to come back with an executive summary as soon as feasible? I mean, it's not gonna be next meeting, but uh, I, at least I don't think it is. Um, is everyone satisfied with that? Yes. yes. And and I yes. say that the Who's Atomic Improvement Committee, it's a tremendous job. I know it took you a while to do this. It was in depth, but this, this has been really helpful. And we will invite you to our meetings, our next meeting when we discuss this, and we'll move this along as quick as possible um, with you with us. We really appreciate it. Thank well, you. We Thank you. We certainly appreciate the opportunity to keep this moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, we need, we need to. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is not in our country pledge. Let me just promote some people. Mark will help me. We should be good with all three now. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, let's go right ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, we're not going to take up too much of your time. I'm going to give a little introduction. And then uh, Karen will talk a little about the history of Nuttner County, and I'll share a little about what we're doing now, and then Luke will talk about the actual pledge. Um, so my name is Louis Fergraf. I'm a volunteer at Bridge, um, and uh, I'm here today uh, along with Karen and Luke to talk about um, Nuttner County, which began as a Nuttner town in 1995. Um, 
and uh, is a nation nationwide uh, movement um, about increasing solidarity when an act of uh, hate happens in the community or preventing acts of hate from happening in the community. Um, and uh, so, Karen, would you like to step in and talk about how we got involved? Sure. Um, as Louis said, in 2017, um, through a, a citizen initiative that was um, through the combined efforts of Multicultural Bridge, the Berkshire Interfaith Organization, and the South County Race Task Force, um, we decided to become a part of the national Not In Our Town movement in response to racist incidents in our town, in our schools, um, targeted acts of um, against religious groups in our community, and also um, increasing concern for our immigrant community in light of changing political climate at that time. Um, we chose Not In Our Town because of its history of success across the country at unifying communities against um, acts of hate and effectively changing the social climate in those communities by um, citizens rallying to support those that have been targeted. So we decided to launch a campaign here back in 2017, um, with partly because it had a unifying logo that could be identified. Um, it included people making a commitment to not be silent when they witnessed acts of ignorance, hate, or intolerance. And um, it included a collaborative approach across the county. We started out um, thinking we would do not in our town and then through interest across the county decided we would make it not in our county. Um, at that time, members of the select board, as well as many individuals and um, businesses across the county took the pledge. Um, and that has provided us with a list, I say us, the multicultural bridge, um, with a list of people to reach out to when incidents occur and be able to support those citizens that have been targeted. Um, so that's a little background and um, how we got to the point where we are now and why we're coming back to you now. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Louie to reach that part. Yeah, so the, the purpose of us being here today, thanks Karen. Um, and the purpose of us being here today is it's an invitation. Um, we sent a document that has a link you can also go to Multicultural Bridges website um, and go to the Not In Our Town link from there. Um, and you can online uh, do the pledge. Um, and it, this is an invitation for anyone who's interested. This isn't something, the, the way Bridge is thinking about this is not um, that we're trying to obligate people to do it. It's actually, we want to like en enroll and engage people who are interested in um in being involved um the commitment at its most essential is small to say the pledge um daily the way i do it for myself is um not necessarily that i say the exact pledge every day but every day i will reflect upon have i done anything today um that's kind of moved things forward um uh, sort of tried to make a little shift um so it's uh, active engagement and commitment. Um, and so th this is an invitation to, uh, for the select board, uh, you know, the newly elected new select, new select board to consider uh, being a part of that in whatever capacity you can. Uh, Luke? Yeah, thanks, Louie, and thanks, Karen, and uh, thanks select board members and everyone uh, doing your part to take care of this town. It's a lot of work tonight and it's been a long meeting and I'm sure this is not rare for you all. Um, I'd like to read the pledge and I'd also like to probably, um, oh, so I'll speak for me, but I think I can speak on behalf of Louie and Karen. Um, and the bridge is all about building relationships and if anyone wants to sit down for a cup of coffee or have a cup of tea to just talk about what this pledge means and, and how to 
make it more of a practice like Louis talking about. Um, we'd be happy to talk about uh, all the all the ways to to plug into social justice um, in the Berkshires. And and so here's the pledge. Um, I commit to working together with my neighbors to create safer, more integrated communities for all residents in Berkshire County. I do not stay silent in the face of intolerance or hate based on race, religion, sexual orientation, gender, identity, ethnicity, country of origin, ability, or any other factor. I work to acknowledge and heal all forms of hate, bigotry, and bullying, and I pledge to renew my commitment to this work every day. Um, yeah, and so um, just like Louis said, uh, we're asking for folks um, to consider signing, for folks that have signed to, to think about what recommitting to the pledge means for you. Thank you very much. Uh, I was here when we first did this and it's as important that now as it was then. And, and I'm glad you're always welcome to come back and remind us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Citizen speak time. Charlie Williamson, go right ahead. Okay, Charlie Williamson, 48 Blue Hill Road. I've uh, noticed here in the last week and a half, we've had outside contractors planting some vegetation on Main Street. <clears throat> I'd like to know what the vegetation is and do you have a ballpark price, what this is costing using these outside contractors? We'll bring that into the next meeting, Charlie. Okay, well, what I wanted to bring up is if it's uh, what I think they're putting there, like swamp grass, this is going to be a problem come next uh, summer. Uh, there are blind spots on our pedestrian crossing ways. Swamp grass grows to at least five foot high. Uh, you're going to have accidents in the town. I do believe we could have used our own town employees to plant this material. And all I'm trying to say is I would like to see the selectmen take a, a three or a five year project of improving the traffic problem in Great Barrington. Um, I know we're working on uh, Lake Mansfield, spending money on that. We spent money on charging stations. It's time to get in pedestrian crossing lights on all the crossing on Main Street. People just walk across there and stop the traffic. You got green lights and nobody's moving. I appreciate if somebody would put it on an agenda to look at it. it it's serious. You can't get through the town of Barrington. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. You're welcome. Vivian Orlowski. Thank you, Steve. Um, I just want to make a brief comment at thanking the Finance Committee for all the research and discussion on senior tax deferral and the Select Board for making this program or recommending that this program to, uh, for town meeting be made more accessible to senior longtime residents. I would also like to follow up briefly on um, Ed Abrams' concerns about other taxpayers having to foot this program. Deferral is not an expense and it does not change tax rates. The deferrals um, are, are not in any way charged as an expense because it does not reduce seniors taxes or give them any funds. The town gets all the taxes that are due, just paid later and with interest. So repay and repayment is secured by the first lien on the deed as we heard from the finance committee and no senior can charge more than 50% uh, the value of their home. So the town is essentially guaranteed to get that money no matter what happens with the real estate market. Um, so just to be clear, the elderly tax deferral safety net is different from exemption programs that Great Barrington already has and rightly so for very low income seniors. Exemption programs are limited and they only 
very slightly reduce the overall revenues for the town, and they only slightly reduce most tax bills because they're limited to something like $1,000. So there's a big difference, and this should not be seen as anything that will impact people's taxes or the overall tax levy. Thank you, Vivian. See no other hands up. So we'll select board time. We'll start with Garfield. I have nothing, thank you. Eric? Uh, nothing, thank you. Ed? Uh, yeah, just uh, quickly since I was mentioned in that, um, you know, the town needs to take in $32 million. If less comes in, everyone else pays a little bit more. It's pennies, which is what I said. It's just pennies because um, it's a small amount. Um, Ultimately, we will get it back. So if you live here until it's all paid back and pay taxes, in the end, it didn't matter. Um, but in a given year, it will raise other people's taxes just a little bit. Thanks. Lee. Nothing. And I have nothing. Media time. <clears throat> Seeing none, by unanimous consent, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.